Hi everyone, this is Rohit from Lifestyle Mastery and I'm excited to have Eric Jorgensen, who's a startup growth guy, writer, uh, and also an angel investor. He, is, he was on the founding team of Zale and has been publishing online since 2014. His business book, Evergreen, has educated and entertained over a million readers. He's uh, a writer of book, career advisor, uniquely ambitious people, and also the author of the new book, Almanac of Naval Ravikant, the guide to wealth and happiness. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me, Rohit. Awesome. So, you know, uh, uh, you, you've written a book about uh, career advice for uniquely ambitious people. You've been a founding team of Zale. Uh, you know, what caught you interested into writing? I understand that you have a full-time full -time job as well, but, uh, you know, what made you write about, uh, about your first book, which is career advice for uniquely ambitious people? Yeah, I, I've always... Um... I don't know, writing has helped me think a lot of times. It helps you get something out of your head. You, you don't even really know what you believe until you start writing it and then you find out what you actually know. Um, and so it, it's humbling and improves your thought process. And so I get a lot out of just the process of writing. Um, but I think on a, on a grander scale, like writing is, is a small path to kind of uh, extend your life almost. You know, the people who've achieved anything close to immortality in, in our small view of it now have done it through, you know, leaving behind a book that lasts for hundreds or thousands of years or, or art, you know, of their own sort. But, uh, writing is, is my medium and kind of always has been. So, uh, that's where it comes from for me. Got it. And, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about the new book that you launched, which is, uh, Almanac of Naval Ravikant. You know, what made you write the book and, uh, you know, uh, what made you, uh, uh, you know, interest you about novel that you wanted to write the book about yeah i mean i really wanted this book to exist you know i've been following naval for 10 years almost i read his blog venture hacks you know back in the early you know 2010s um i've been following him on twitter for a long time listening to his talks and learned a lot from him um and, and i keep referring to his knowledge with friends and quoting him and stuff like that and it's just not quite the same it's hard to introduce somebody to someone who's you followed for so long and they have so many different things out there in a bunch of different places i just wanted this book to exist so um i kind of put the offer out into the universe and people were excited about it and i started chipping away. And as soon as people were kind of, um, you know, watching the project evolve, all of a sudden I was working harder on it and increased my standards for it and wanted it to be better and better. Um, and uh, it just kind of snowballed into into the project that it is today. Got it. And, uh, uh, you know, I understand that you're a full-time job. How did you write along with, with, your, with, with your job? Because I think the book is around 200 pages. Uh, what was your framework and process when you wanted to write a book? I, I've written a very small book about golf, uh, but, you know, I'll say it published it. I found it really hard to write those 10,000 words. Uh, but, but I wanted to understand, you know, what was your process and, and framework when you, uh, when you want to write a book, which is, uh, which is as good as what you've done? Yeah, it's very... Um... I gave myself space and time to do it. You know, this is a hobby for me. Like I didn't have a deadline. I didn't have to get it done by a certain time. Uh, and so I just chipped away at it when I was interested in it. And the thing that's awesome about writing a book is especially when there's not a deadline is that you can kind of set your own pace on it. You know, when you're self published, um, there's, there's no publisher waiting for it. You didn't get an advance paid that they're like, you know, making you do it by a certain deadline. Uh, so there's no rush. And I just got to kind of do it like a hobby. And when I was interested in it and, um, you know, I got to put it down for a few weeks if, if I wasn't sure how to make progress or if I wasn't super enthusiastic about it. And then I picked it back up and started working on it again when I was excited about it, where I wanted to revisit the ideas. Um, and so it was always kind of pleasurable for me, even, you know, though it took, a lot of work and hundreds and hundreds of hours. And, you know, there were, there were hard moments and there were times when I just had to kind of grind it out. But um, for the most part, it was, it was enjoyable, kind of like happy work for me, you know? Got it. And, uh, you know, since, uh, when you, uh, you know, since you've written a book about a guy, um, uh, you also invite a lot of, uh, you also understand and you think about a lot of, a uh, lot of the things that Naval ha uh, would have done. And, uh, you know, Naval is, is known for lo for his, you know, mental models and, you know, uh, how he has uh, uh, grown over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, he's, he's built a company and now he's, the, he's created an angel, which is, an, which is a great platform. Uh, are these some of the, um, you know, what do you think are some of the more important mental models which listeners should also 
uh, could also learn from the world that you know and they could also apply uh, in their lives yeah there's, there's a whole chapter of mental models there um and, and i tried to focus kind of on the unique ones that naval talks about um and some of those being uh falsifiability so uh, this is kind of a fundamental piece of science making sure that any claim is falsifiable through clear proof um, you know, a hypothesis can either be proven or disproven. If it's not falsifiable, then it's not a kind of fundamental piece of truth that you can carry forward. Um, another one that he, he pulls from uh, uh, Nassim Talib is a black swan. So just looking out for incredibly rare events that are incredibly high impact. Those are things that, that govern our life in a disproportionate way that people tend to overlook or um, kind of use a narrative bias to diminish the, the importance of. But he, you know, Naval talks about um, Charlie Munger and, and has really relied on some of the foundational work that Charlie Munger did in collecting mental models, you know, starting with Cialdini of all of the sort of pieces of human misjudgment and all the predictable ways that we, you know, misread and misunderstand things. Um, and, and the tools for thought that Munger talks about, like inversion, um, you know, looking at something in reverse, trying to avoid a bad outcome instead of force a good outcome. You know, that's kind of a, a classic one. And Shane Parrish at Farnham Street has done a lot of work around expanding and continuing to do those mental models. Um, Blas Moros at Lattice Work has, is, has a beautiful website uh, that continues to push that mental models work. So um, it, it's a kind of a set of thinking tools that a lot of the people that I admire most um, have in common or, or use or build on in their own ways. And I, I've found it helpful in kind of, you know, teaching yourself to think in, in a unique way that gives you a little bit of um, an advantage in a space compared to other people that are kind of following, you know, the trends or the, um, you know, whatever's most popular in their area. Got it. And, you know, you know, it's great that you talked about Charlie Munger because uh, there's a book about Charlie Munger, which is Almanac of Charlie Munger. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been a big fan of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, but, uh, uh, but, but the mental models of uh, Charlie Munger and a lot of different uh, Charlie uh, may or may not believe in Bitcoin or angel investing or technology for that matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, what do you think is the difference and, uh, and or do you think there's a difference between what Charlie talks about and what Naval talks about when, when it comes to, you know, uh, say investing into Bitcoin, which as a technologist, we, we really understand, but uh, Charlie has some very strong opinions about Bitcoin. Uh, so what are your thoughts? Do you think there's a difference in their mental models or do you think there's a lot of similarities in the way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are... Um... There are a lot of dis like there are a lot of similarities between Naval and Munger. I know Naval has learned a lot from Munger, but there are also a huge amount of differences, right? Um, so Charlie Munger is very is as you said not a technologist. You know he's kind of an old school guy. He's like you know served in World War II and invested in mostly like insurance companies and retail. You know his, his main holding is like Costco and Glen Air and um, these kind of basic classic things that Warren Buffett specializes in. And Naval has always kind of been reading sci-fi and looking at the future and applying technology and looking closer to like the edge of science. And so while they are both, you know, investors and um, sort of generalists in that they, they study the basics of a ton of different fields and apply them, the things that they choose to apply them to are, are very different. And um, of course, they're going to end up with very different opinions on, you know, Bitcoin in particular. Um, and I think I probably trust, uh, you know, the work that Naval has put into Bitcoin a little bit more than the work that Charlie Munger has put into Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, there's things that, that, you know, Munger is much more believable about, you know, any financial services company probably than, than Naval is just because that's where he spent so much of the focus, but they have both used, you know, some of those foundational mental models of, of misjudgment or of, um, you know, the, the basics across a wide range of disciplines, you know, from biology to um, economics, microeconomics in particular, to, to become who they are and make the decisions that they've made. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to see how the same set of tools can be used to build two completely different perspectives and two completely different, uh, you know, fortunes, really. Okay. Interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Naval has also done uh, a, a famous podcast with, you know, how wealth is created, uh, which is one of, one of his most famous uh, podcast interviews. And very interestingly, he talks about, you know, capital labor 
coding and media or the other four leverages uh, capital and labor were always uh, you know uh, uh, permission led uh, leverages and coding and media uh, uh, are new forms of leverages uh, you know i want to understand and also the listeners you know who 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 are budding entrepreneurs and want to want to create wealth in their lifetime how can you use leverage uh, to increase wealth and progress and you know somebody somebody like me who's a business guy and can't code uh, you know how do how do we leverage uh, a, a skill set like podcasting or media or uh, you know use this leverage to to make sure that we are able to meet our uh, you know it create wealth not only for ourselves but also for the society yeah leverage is um i think for me one of the most kind of fresh and interesting ideas that that the book opened up and i it has kind of been top of mind for me to keep unpacking and exploring that because i think there's so much more um there's more classifications there's more understanding to do there's more research and kind of study to do and on how we practically apply it um and it's really interesting to not just use it as a lens to see how did successful people become successful but you know, what are the tools available to me, the tools of leverage available to anybody in any different circumstance and how do you put them together? So um, I think, you know, one of the most interesting pieces is how do you, how do you get started? You know, if you, if you are at zero with no leverage, um, you have access to things that you did not have access to a hundred years ago and you can kind of build up enough leverage to continue to start that compounding machine. And, and it's much more of a, um, I don't know, meritocracy in, in that it's permissionless. Like as soon as you create something permissionless, all of a sudden anyone can throw their hat in the ring and start creating and start building. And that is a, um, that is a tremendous like, force for good and a kind of a leveling um, force across all of humanity. So um, the kind of permissionless things like this podcast, like, like coding, um, like writing, let us get started and go from kind of zero to one. The, the classic forms of leverage, like capital, labor, tools even, I think are, are a form of leverage that um, aren't talked about as much uh, by Naval, but are certainly classify, um, where you can just keep reinvesting those profits into what are fundamentally a bunch of different force multipliers, right? So if you're out there in the woods trying to cut down a tree and you're doing it with your bare hands, it's going to take you a thousand hours maybe, but if you have an ax, it'll take a hundred. If you have a chainsaw, it'll take 10. And if you have a tractor, it's going to take one. Um, and so those are different outcomes, uh, using different levels of tools. And those tools are all, you know, available to us. You know, this podcast is a little bit more of an abstract example, but once we've recorded it once, 10 people might listen to it or 10,000 people might listen to it. It took us the same amount of time, but you'll make, you know, infinitely more ad revenue. Um, after 10,000 listens or 100,000 listens and this podcast is going to be working for you for the next 10 years, as long as, you know, whatever the life of that media is, no one's stopping you from recording it. No one's stopping you from putting it out there. Um, and if people listen to it and enjoy it, it's just going to keep working for you, you know, in the same way that automations, um, you know, computer automations can do the same thing. So whether or not you can code is, is less and less relevant. You can set up Zapier or Airtable or if this then that automations and the computers can work for you executing rules that you set up, you know, in an hour and that task can get repeated a hundred thousand times just the way you lined it out. Like that is a form of leverage that automation. Um, and all it takes for you is the judgment and skill to know what automation to set and at what time and how to set it. Right. So there are still skills um, and perspectives and decisions that have to be made that, we all need to work on improving and understanding and seeing opportunities and understanding the tools that we have available to us and how to use them. Um, but once those things are running, if the right things are running, you know, they, the winds can get quite big. Um, and, and now uniquely there is no, um, nothing stopping you from getting started. Okay. And, uh, do you have any favorite form of leverage, uh, especially for, for people into their twenties and, uh, they're still trying to figure out what they want to do. Uh, uh, you know, it, what, what sort of leverage, uh, would you, would you, uh, advise them to start off uh, so that they can, they can compound and really help them, uh, later, later in the stage. I don't think there's a best form of leverage. I think they're, um, all personalities are suited to different kinds of leverage, you know? So um, someone who's highly analytical, precise, math oriented, may do better with capital leverage 
um, and understanding, you know, their return on invested capital across different times and periods. And they may have a better time um, raising money. They may have a better time deploying it. Um, somebody who's very charismatic or outgoing or has a lot of soft skills may have uh, create a lot of value by building an audience, building a community, building a team, um, and, and getting kind of more human leverage, uh, human effort leverage. Somebody who's you know an incredible programmer may do or or very kind of um, handy with their hands. So programmers may do very, better with computers. Um, one one thing I think about a lot, uh, just as a mental picture, is is like the oil rigs. You know, you drive by an oil rig and there's just a machine running. It's just a little gas engine driving this thing that is just uh, mining oil for. Uh, those I think those things run for like a hundred years, right? It's a simple machine right. that once you set up, it just works for a really, really long period of time. Um, and so there's things that we are all inclined to do. Um, but the things that, uh, in choosing your tools of leverage, um, you've really got to examine who you are and what you're good at. Um, the, the problem that you're trying to solve, you know, with some sort of scale and whether that's accessible to you at the time, right? It, you know, if it takes, um, a huge number of tools to build. And if it takes a land to, to get that oil mining rig going and you don't have it, you're nowhere near that, then like, that's not the right form for you. If you just have a computer, then now all of a sudden coding is available to you in a way that it wasn't before. So, um, you know, rather than focus on trying to attain a specific form, you know, look at where you are in this maze and what's nearby you and just start building. Got it. No, you're absolutely right. I think personality really matters and what, what sort of leverage you should take up. But, uh, you know, another thing which Naval talk, talks about that, you know, status is a zero sum game and uh, you should avoid people to, uh, people who play that game. But, uh, but what happens is that uh, we inherently do play that game. Like uh, we look at credentials and we look at signaling, like, you know, somebody done, uh, you know, uh, an MBA from Harvard or Stanford, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a much better state as you go to Goldman Sachs. Uh, but, uh, but what does he really mean uh, by, by uh, you know, state, by not to play by status? Uh, and, you know, what, 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 what in your view, uh, or, you know, what does Nawal really think about, uh, you know, what, uh, should we look at power or money uh, as, the, as, the, as the game to play? Or is it about knowledge, gaining knowledge? Yeah, I think um, from a place of, of no judgment, um, we are all choosing to play different games and and that's perfectly okay. Um, I think the framing that Naval uses in that tweet storm is, hey, this is for people who want to build wealth. If your goal is to build wealth, um, which is you know a path towards kind of financial freedom and freedom of your time and freedom of freedom to build the knowledge that you want and have the family life that you want and invest your time in in yourself and your the pursuits that you want, then you're going to need to build wealth. And if your focus is on building wealth, learn to understand when you are working towards wealth and when you're working towards status. Um, and so uh, separating those two and, uh, you know, a lot of times you see people who are famous and we, we conflate the idea of fame and being known with being wealthy and forget about all the thousands or millions of people who are incredibly wealthy and incredibly unknown because they started a, you know, Ziploc bag manufacturing company in Dayton, Ohio, and nobody's ever heard their name, but you know, they have 10, 50, a hundred million dollars. And that is, you know, they, they are doing just fine. They're happy. They have free time. They have, you know, whatever they may need. Well, maybe they're happy. I don't know, but they, but they have not sought status. They have sought wealth. Um, and there are people who are incredibly famous who are miserable and poor. And that is a, um, that is a bad combo. And when you look at the kind of, um, especially on social media, anybody who is trying to kind of build wealth, you, people find themselves getting attacked as soon as you're above a certain kind of, um, you know, a, a tree that stands above to any extent, like it just, when the audience grows, like haters show up and it's almost like a law of physics. Right. Um, but that that's okay. And like that comes with the territory and those people may be playing a status game and that's a different game than the game that you're playing. Politicians are usually playing a status game. You know, there's one Senate seat or one prime minister's chair and you have to get number one spot or you're nothing. Um, and those people, play status games by attacking each other, 
right? And politicians are attacking each other. And in the world of wealth building and in business and investing, it is almost always a positive sum game where everyone can win by helping each other. And, you know, the total pool of wealth grows. And every time two people transact, you know, one person is better off for having opted into the transaction and having consumer surplus and the company is better off for having profited and provided a service. Um, and so, you know, allowing that to kind of take its course and appreciating it for what it is. And, um, you know, it just ties into another one of his ideas, which is if you secretly despise wealth, it will elude you. You know, if you are, if you are driven by jealousy and envy of the, you know, people who have things that you want um, and you secretly hate people who have accomplished those things, we're going to subconsciously feel that you're going to even have an internal conflict over whether you should be pursuing wealth because you don't, um, you maybe don't think it is ethical. You know, if, if you don't believe that wealth creation is ethical, um, then you're going to find conflict within yourself while you're pursuing it. And, and so uh, understanding that and unpacking that um, maybe necessary kind of pre-work before you can make much progress in the wealth creation game. Got it. I, th I think uh, Naval once tweeted that it's better to be rich than than being famous or being, uh, you know, uh, poor and uh, being famous. Uh, uh, you know, Naval also talks about what to productivize yourself. Uh, you know, I wanted to understand, uh, do you think careers can, uh, should be looked at as a product or does he mean to look at yourself as a, as a, as a product with differentiation? Just, uh, I was not able to, you know, fully understand the concept of how do you, how do you, how does one productize themselves? Yeah. Uh, productize yourself is a, um, is a very dense summary of that, those ideas and it's hard to unpack. And I, I hope the book does a, a little bit better job than the podcast can at, at unpacking that. Um, but if you look at the two, um, kind of words, productize yourself and, and starting with yourself, um, this, this took me a long time to kind of internalize. Also, if you start with yourself, you'll really focus on, understanding your own skills and your own talents and your own interests. Um, you know, a lot of people, and I spent many years doing this, study other successful people and try to kind of follow that playbook rather than um, observing your own skills and strengths and finding the things that you do naturally and your own talents and applying those um, rather than, you know, forcing yourself into the shape that, or the example that someone else set. The other piece of yourself is to look at uh, taking accountability. So being responsible for uh, taking responsibility for the downside is how you get, you earn responsibility for the upside. So you have to kind of put your, your skin in the game a little bit in order to uh, fairly earn the wealth that comes out of the other side. So that can be an investment of time. It can be an investment of money. It can just be an investment of reputation, but you have to put yourself out there. So those, those are kind of the two pieces of yourself when we look at productize, that's when we get back to looking at leverage, at scale, at replication. Um, and the foundation of that is finding something that society does not yet know how to get, but wants. And that's your product or, or your service, um, but usually your product because the products are more scalable. So if you can find a way to solve someone's problem and do it over and over and over and over again, you know, a hundred times, a thousand times, um, with your product by productizing yourself, um, that is kind of the path to success. So if you can create one, you know, I mean, let's use Naval's tweet storm as an example. You know, he wrote one tweet storm. Millions of people have read it now, something yeah. like that. He wrote it once. It took him maybe a lifetime to distill his own wisdom. He published it under his own name. Um, but once he tweeted it, a million people can read it. Two million people can read it and benefit from it and solve that, use that to solve their own problems. So that in that, just one example, he productized himself in the form of a tweet storm for $0, but he could have just as easily done it in a book or in a course or in a, you know, university, like, and, and all of those would have been, you know, uh, reasonable ways to productize the, um, his unique kind of insights and learning and understanding and, that is like a, um, once you see that, that kind of example, you can start to look at it, uh, look at other people as how they have productized themselves, whether that's in a job or in a company. Um, and Jack, Jack Butcher, who did the illustrations for the book has done an incredible job of this. He's got a deep skill set as a designer, um, and has really 
learned how to productize that through courses and community and um, is building kind of a thriving business out of his unique talents and personality. And it's uh, incredible to watch. He's, he's a living example. Interesting. And uh, you, you, you talked about Twitter. I just wanted to understand, uh, I mean, uh, Nawal has, has really uh, uh, utilized this, this uh, product so well. Um, and I also feel that, you know, uh, some of the smartest people uh, are on Twitter and you can, uh, you know, Facebook maybe uh, is for p- people who are there in the past, people who you were school friends and college friends, but Twitter is where you know the future is, and some of the smartest people are there. Uh, how can how can I or others use Twitter to you know distill our thoughts and and to attract people uh, and uh, to build a community? Uh, I just wanted to understand your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I've learned a lot from Twitter. Um... I like the idea that every Twitter is different, right? We're kind of uh, assembling our own curriculum every time we choose someone to follow on Twitter. And so, you know, I've got quite a mix of nutritionists and investors and startup founders and comedians. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a blend of all of the things that I'm interested in. And you're kind of constantly falling down this rabbit hole of, you know, who's doing interesting, funny things and how can I get more of those? And, oh, this is getting repetitive or overwhelming. So I'm going to opt out of this one and add it in, in somebody else. Um, so I've gotten a lot out of it just as a consumer. Um, but I also kind of appreciate what happens when you put some of your ideas out there, you know, and you've got to be a little willing to look stupid because uh, they're half formed ideas and you have, you know, 200 characters to explain them. And so of course there are exceptions and of course there are very reasonable ways to disagree. Um, but it starts a conversation and it starts to attract, um, you know, the, the input of people that you're interested in and you start to build a little bit of, um, I mean, it's almost a resume. My, my Twitter account is much more probably valuable for someone who wants to understand who I am and what I think about than my resume is, you know, my resume is what I've done. My Twitter is a live stream of my thoughts for the last 10 years. Um, and so those tell very different stories, but it's, it's helped me, you know, um, find great friends and I've met people through Twitter and I've traveled with them and I've met people that I've, you know, followed for years when I end up halfway around the world and I'm in their city. I'm like, man, I've been following you for three years. Like I love all the stuff you put out. Let's get dinner. And it's led to a lot of great relationships and perspectives that I just, you know, would never have been able to see without a tool, uh, a tool like that. And uh, I, I can't recommend it enough, but it, I also spend, you know, an hour or two a day on it probably at this point. So um, it is an investment too. You know, it's, um, it takes a lot of, I want to say work, but it doesn't feel like work. It feels like a thing that I just want to do. You know, maybe I do that instead of playing video games. I try to get more likes or, you know, find something new and interesting or find new something to read. Um and it's just, a, you know, it's one of the games that I choose to play, but I'm on Twitter more than I, I don't do really do anything on Facebook or Instagram. Um, Cause that's just where I play. Got it. And uh, uh, you know, uh, you also got the forward by Tim Ferriss. Um, how, how did that happen? And, you know, I'm a big fan of, of <laughs> Tim and, 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 you know, the kind of, he's got a big following out here in India as, as well, but uh, wanted to understand, you know, how did, how did that happen? And how yeah. did he, yeah. I've been a fan of Tim for a long time. I remember reading four hour work week when I was 18 or 19 and it just doubled the size of my brain, I think, and really took down some, um, some blinders I had on as to how the world worked. Um, you know, I, I can't claim much credit for the, for the forward. I think that has a lot more to do with Naval and Tim's, you know, relationship, uh, than anything else. But, uh, yeah. And I know Tim does not write forwards. And, and the only reason he did this is because, you know, we worked to make this book freely available for everybody online. And, and it's kind of a unique, you know, format. It's all, it's all on the website. It's um, it is a physical book, but it is also just a collection and a project that is um, out there in the world. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a, I don't think it's something he's in the habit of doing and I don't expect it. It had much to do with me, um, but that's, I'm, I'm very grateful that he, uh, that he did it. And I, I think it has a fair amount to the book. Um, I hope people enjoy it. Interesting. And, uh, you know, you've talked about that, uh, the book, uh, is, uh, you can, anybody can download for free, obviously, but, but w- w- why was the thought to, uh, to keep it free and, uh, you know, 
uh, what was the framework behind that? Yeah, I mean, Naval was um, adamant about that from from the very beginning, um, which I, I totally understood and understand more now that that time goes on because I see um, you know, people in my DMs or email all the time who are like, hey, I, I can't get access to this. It's not on uh, Amazon in my country. It's not, and, and it's um, it's easy to take for granted the kind of access that that we have sometimes um, or platforms that you just take for granted. And it feels amazing to have it out there now and have no barrier around it. You know, this, I want to believe that these ideas kind of uniquely are evergreen in the sense that they will apply in many years and pretty close to universal in that, like almost anyone can get one life changing idea out of this book at the very least. And um, it's, it's very rewarding to have that spread as far and as far and wide as, as it can be. And I hope um, that people find something useful in it. You know, we, we are all, um, we're all repackaging and redistilling people that came before us. You know, Naval has spent a lifetime reading philosophers and science fiction and nonfiction and the service that he does through his Twitter and his podcast is distilling the wisdom that he has learned. And, you know, the work that I added on top of that was just reorganizing a lot of the things that he had distilled and shared. Um, and you know, we have all learned so much from the people that come before us and owe a lot to not just the previous generation, but generations. And, uh, you know, this, this book will do fine. And, and I'm, I'm not relying on this for my career. This is, um, this is a hobby and one that I'm, I'm very happy to have be, uh, just, just go in the good karma category. No, absolutely. I think I think education. I think it's good thing about education. It's a positive sum experience, and if you're putting out thoughts and you're putting out uh, content for for free, I think it's 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 a, it's a great for everybody who can you know read uh, and back on how Naval really thinks. And uh, you know, Naval also talks about uh, some of the most important decisions you take is where you live. Uh, who you are with and what you do. And because of the pandemic, you know, uh, I, I know I've moved across uh, uh, the continent, but, uh, but do you think uh, the, uh, a lot of cities, a lot of big, big cities will, will really die down and it won't matter where, uh, you know, a place like San Francisco, uh, the, the network of X would go away from places like San Francisco, Bangalore, uh, or do you think, no, it's, it's a it's temporary solution uh, where you live would really matter uh, going forward. Well, I'm, I'm, I haven't studied the problem deeply, but I think this is um, often presented as a binary thing, and it's not. Um, you know, on the one hand, we've seen a slow, constant improvement of remote tools and towards kind of location independence, um, and so I think to some extent that will continue. Um, probably the the pandemic accelerated it a little bit, but it also overcorrected. It, like it, the, uh, I don't know how permanent that the change is. So I think that will continue at some pace, give or take. Um, but I also think that we are social beings and that we find being in physical places with people that we want to be with and work with deeply rewarding, like our genes, you know, hum and sing when we can be in like close proximity with people and feel that energy. And so I don't think that that is going to, um, I don't think that that's going to disappear, you know, just because Zoom exists now. Um, and so I think both of those things are true. I think cities will still reign. Um, but I think that more people who want to be able to be independent will be independent. And it may be more, there may be more cities that reign. Um, and so the, the kind of um, number of big nodes might go up uh, or number of medium nodes may go up and the size of the biggest nodes might go down a little, but you know, those are, those are small changes in tide in the, in the big scheme of things. That's my guess. Got it, got it. It's, uh, we have to be seeing, you know, it's next 10 years, we'll, we'll understand how, how this has really panned out. And, uh, you know, after the book, uh, what's the plan? Do you plan to write more books? Uh, is there any uh, one like Elon Musk or something else you want to write a book on? Uh, I, I like, I love this format and I had a lot of fun doing this project. So I can imagine doing, um, another book, although, um, I'm not, I'm not jumping into it and, I, and I'm not exactly sure who would come next. Um, 
I, I think there's a lot of ideas left to explore in this book. I mean, just this conversation um, is, you know, another log on that fire for me. I think leverage is incredibly interesting and I, I plan to do more writing and more exploration around that. Um, that may, you know, come together in a, in a course or something. I get a lot of questions about leverage and about um, from people about how to uncover their specific knowledge. And so I think those are things that may um, deserve another kind of deep dive. Um, you know, there's, there's all the, uh, books, the whole last chapter is recommended reading from Naval yes. about things that, uh, he found formative that he loved. And I think it'd be really fun to put together, um, like a reading group of people who want to read those books together and study them together and create some accountability and some conversation and some community around that. So, um, there's just, there's plenty of projects and lots of exciting ideas to, uh, roads to go down now. Um, so we'll see what happens. And you know, I quickly want to the top three. Oh, what's your favorite business book? My favorite business book is uh, is probably Poor Charlie's Almanac. Um, I mean, that's that started a lot of things for me. And picking that off my dad's bookshelf at twenty one was uh, was extremely formative. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent book. And you know, if you could go back in time when you uh, started writing uh, the, the book, uh, Almanac of No No We Can't, what is the one thing you would have focused on or done anything differently? I mean, I wish I knew what I, I could have done it in half the time if I knew what I knew now about how the book finishes and, um, and what it looks like, you know, I, I went through a lot of struggles about whether I should be writing anything in the book about the ideas or whether I should just get out of the way and only use kind of the raw material from Naval. I wasn't even sure it should be a book. I was like, maybe this needs to be a blog or a, you know, some other format or something like that, some live updated website. Um, and I'm really happy with, with the way everything turned out, but I, I wish I could have, uh, you know, I wish I could have had more clarity when I started, but that's not how it works. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's not how creative projects go. Uh, and uh, do you have any favorite online tool, for example, Gmail, Slack, Zoom? Uh, I mean, I use all, you know, Gmail, Google Suite, Slack, Zoom, Notion. Um, I, I don't think I have many secrets in this department. Uh, Otter, I love Otter AI. Um, that's a really cool kind of live transcription thing. And so, um, you know, I do like customer interviews and, and research calls and things like that. And having recordings and transcriptions are, um, are incredibly helpful for that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably my only like secret, secret love. Um, but I'm not, I'm not too adventurous on the tool side of things. Sure. And, um, uh, you know, what is the best way people can, uh, you know, can buy the book, uh, uh, yeah, the book is available um, if you want the physical version in paperback and hardcover on Amazon um, and through Kindle. If you want the free version, you can download EPUB, Mobi, PDF. You can read it on the website um, and uh, yeah, join the mailing list. I'll keep everybody updated with uh, you know new stuff that Naval comes out with, writing you know kind of deeper about the ideas that uh, we're going to go into, and if we do anything. Um, you know, exciting around leverage specific knowledge or a reading group or something like that. You'll, you'll find out about it there. Correct. And uh, we'll put that in the show notes. And, um, Eric, what is the best way people can reach out to you uh, um, on Twitter or on social media platforms? Yeah. Uh, Twitter's easy. I got open DMS. Um, you can email me. My email's on the website. I'm, I'm uh, slightly buried in messages, but I love talking to people one-on-one -on -one and, um, I learn a lot from from those conversations, so I, I welcome uh, I welcome tweets and tweets and emails. Got it. Well, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, uh, Eric, I loved reading a book, and um, I'm, it's an honor to have you uh, on my podcast and talk about uh, about some of the uh, some of the things that Naval has written. Thank you so much for taking our time. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks, Rohit. I appreciate it.